so nice to to see you all. Good morning, Poker Toe, for those of you who are in morning time zones. It's amazing to see all these places where you, where you all are from. This is this is a real pleasure. Um, today we're going to be uh, looking at a couple texts, which are which are some of my favorites, and and, and honestly, like the the most transformative um, for for myself and my practice. And I. Um, I, I hope that they they land for you, and I'm curious what questions they're going to bring up. Um, thanks, Julie, for sharing this source sheet. Um, I'll do some uh, uh, sharing uh, of the screen, but I also love to to be able to look at you. So, um, if you can open a in a in a separate uh, window, so that way you can kind of see each other and um, see the source sheet. But I'll I'll go back and forth because I hear that that's. That's your minhag. That's that's often what what the practice is um, in these uh, these Zoom calls. Um, you're having trouble hearing. Um, are other people having trouble hearing also? Seems to be okay. Okay, um, it might be on your side. Um, thanks so much. Um, if um, Julie's on the tech side of this, uh, if if you need help um, with anything, um, oh. It's so lovely to see where all of you are coming from. So tonight's te today's text, we're going to be looking um, at the beginning of Genesis. And we're looking at the uh, the beginning of the of the creation narrative, really the second creation narrative, um, where we um, where Adam and Eve are created, um, and uh, and how they're created. Um, speaking more closely into the microphone. Okay, I can do that. Um, I can I can talk loudly. Uh, thanks so much. Um, so um, we're going to um, be looking at the beginning of Genesis. We're going to be looking then at a piece of midrash um, uh, and a rather famous one. Um, uh, so um, um, you might be familiar with it, and but it might be new that, to to many of you also. And then what what I'm really excited to to go and, and see with you is actually where this text kind of gets interpreted in Kabbalah. Um, and how the the mystics um, kind of build a super commentary on this in a way that um, that might be impactful and a, and a useful model for thinking about about our relationships um, with each other, with ourselves, and and with the world. Um, so um, I guess I should just uh, for the for uh, for time's sake, I'll I'll, I'll read the texts and. Um, uh, and after um, after I read the the first text, uh, we're gonna I'll take some comments and questions um, and, and wonderings about what this means. Obviously, this text has been used um, because it's so famous um, in many different ways throughout history, and some of them have been um, pretty exclusionary, um, uh, uh, especially for folks. Um, uh, based on like uh, the the gender assumptions that, that go into this and the sexual assumptions that go into it, um, I am um, I am not unaware of it. I am not suggesting that this is the only way to think about relationships. And in fact, I'm going to suggest that like some of the problematic stuff. We'll see how how later uh, generations of rabbis have actually kind of maybe addressed. And you can be a judge of like whether it's addressing it enough or not. So Genesis. Um, Thanks, Julie. God said, it is not good for the earthling to be alone. I will make a fitting helper for him. And God formed out of the earth all the wild beasts and all the birds of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called each creature, that would be its name. And the man gave names to all the cattle uh, and to the birds of the sky and to all the wild beasts. But for Adam, no fitting helper was found. So God cast a deep sleep upon the man. And while he slept, God took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at its spot. And God fashioned the rib that had been taken from the man into a woman. Um, and, brought, and God brought her to the man. Then the man said, this one is the, uh, at last is the bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, um, for from man she was taken. Hence a man leaves her father, his father and mother and clings to his wife, so that they become one flesh. Um, so, um, my primary question for here is like, what does this say about the nature of relationships, uh, romantic relationships, 
um, in particular. Do I take these questions written or, uh, or, or do people contribute locally, Julie? Um, usually we go through the chat, but we can definitely unmute people as you uh, wish. Okay, so, so, so just throw some things out in the chat. That works great because we're, we're, we're being efficient for time in this 30 minute block. Um, thanks, Janine. So there's a couple things. Um, People need each other. Yeah, people need each other. I love that. Um, we, um, it's not good to be alone. And in, the, in, the, in, in uh, context, God's just created the world and said, this is good and that's good and light is good and the stars are good and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and animals are good. And, uh, and then we're told rather strikingly, it's not good for humans to be alone. Humans are meant to have a relationship, not to be alone. There can be satisfaction to live with others similar species yeah that um uh that like we need partners uh who uh or like companionship i mean lots of there are lots of things that we can get with dogs or other animals but there's something unique about human relationships um i love that michael that god saying that god doesn't that that god doesn't want to be alone and you can kind of you can kind of wonder how does god know that it's not good to be alone um, and the mystics kind of pick that up and say like, oh, that's actually why God created the world, because God didn't want to be alone, not just, and, that, and thus was, was empathetic with, with us humans. Um, um, God's an important part of play in this, that some people think of like that as being like wrapped up in their shirt, and the idea of, of partnership. Great, so the thing about the rib, um, we're going to actually look at right next. Um, Josh, I think we're going to keep things on muted for now. And I uh, apologize for that because actually I just like love hearing people's voices, but I'm trying to fit within this, this form. Um, yeah, where does individuality lie um, is a great question because we're, this is kind of talking about dependence of sort. And where does inter, uh, like independence, and maybe in, in interdependence. How do, how do those work into this? Um, yeah, helpmate is a lovely word. Um, yeah, Tanya, there's actually a crazy midrash that says that that the only that that Adam actually had sex with all the animals and found out that they weren't the right fit, um, and that's where uh, and that's why we needed the human beings. Hi, um, Sarah. Um, um, Nice to see you. Uh, I know it's really gross, um, and like we've outlawed bestiality ever since then. Um, but uh, but there's like this thing about um, uh, like on one level the biblical idea of knowing is is sometimes understood to be sexual. Um, yeah, man's dependence on woman, but not women's dependence on man. So perhaps it's an interesting way it shows that woman is superior because she doesn't need to cleave. Yeah, um, there is something, there's something very gendered about the last line. I wanna just like highlight it. I work with a lot of couples transition to marriage. I run cohorts for um, folks. I have, right now I have a cohort for activists and a cohort for people in interfaith relationships or multi-faith relationships. And, um, and people often think about um, the question of leaving your parents' house in, in order to create a new partnership and how, that, how those dynamics are constantly changing between parent and child as people go through different life stages. Um, so um, um, Lilith is a great question and we're just, and this is, um, it'll take us too far afield. Um, so um, we're gonna look at the next text and I'll actually, I'll, I'll screen share. Um, uh, yeah, and separations is totally what we're what we're doing. So um, here is um, this is Breshid Rabbah. It's eighth century uh, rabbinic midrash, um, and um, uh, on on the book of Genesis, um, Rabbi Yirmiyah, son of Elazar, said, "When God created the first earthling, it was created an androgynous intersex." 
uh, and thus it is written, male and female did God create them. The rabbis don't have a concept of gender, um, but they definitely have a concept of, of um, they, they really know human bodies and they know that not all humans fit into the binaries of, uh, of men and women. Um, and in fact, the rabbis of the Talmud of this period actually had six different sexes that they were very excited about um, putting people into. Um, but this is saying that, the, that men and women or male and female, God created them, that this, this first being actually was both male and female and that's how they were able to be separated. Um, another text here, so, so another interpretation, which is kind of an interesting parallel. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman said, when God created the first earthling, God created him with two faces, one on each side, and God later split him along the middle, forming two backs. They, the other rabbis, challenged him saying, it is not written that God took one of his ribs. Shmuel, this, the author of this said, um, when the word uh, mitzvotav, it's not, it doesn't mean a rib, but it rather means a side. So um, I, I'm not in the, the chat right now, but, I, but someone said, I, I heard that it didn't mean rib. This is the text. It actually comes from earlier places. There's, there's much earlier, almost like uh, first, first century texts that also kind of say this, say this, but not quite as clearly. But the first human being was almost created like the, if you imagine the Roman god Janus, that they were two uh, attached um, beings that were, that were fused back to back. Um, and, um, and they were, they were able to be two faces, but they, they couldn't be partners because they were, they couldn't see each other. Um, and, uh, and, and that, that being was lonely. So God put it to sleep, sawed it apart, and then it was able to come back together face to face. Um, so that's a, um, a really different take. Um, it's, uh, it, it might change some of the dynamics um, of who is, um, um, Sarah, can you just send me an, an, an email about that because I'm, I'm doing this, but that sounds great. Um, the, uh, maybe that's where the slang two backed beast came from. I didn't know that. Um, it's interesting, yeah, because the first human being was two backed. They actually only had one back is the image. Um, and then after they're separated from each other, then they finally have two backs. Um, um, yeah, so what Tanya is saying that God, that God, that Hashem has masculine and feminine natures is actually a, a parallel in the Drash that says that if humans are created in the image of God and humans are, inter, are created as intersex, that um, actually maybe God is also intersex, is also an androgynous. Uh, this is an eighth century text um, because, um, because that's how all people could be created in the image of God, is if, all, if God actually contains all of our aspects. That's a pretty anthropomorphic uh, image that lots of other rabbis, especially like Maimonides, would reject. But it's an interesting perspective, especially as we like moderns and postmoderns try to like make sense out of changing um, awareness um, for, for, for gender. Um, yeah, the Shechina. Yeah, so the Shechina and Hakadosh Baruch Hu, those two parts fused together. Um, the Shechina uh, Tanya used is, is the word is a name for the feminine aspect of God. Uh, no, 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 no. There's no right spellings uh, in transliteration. You're good. Um, the um, uh, the Shechina is um, is understood in the mystical tradition to be a feminine aspect of God, kind of paralleling a particular masculine idea of God um, and that they are constantly striving towards union. And what we're going to see, and actually this, it's a great transition because this next text is um, actually gets to the dynamics of that union. Because for the mystics, there's actually two different types of union between the Shekhinah and the Kaddish Baruch Hu, the masculine and the feminine aspects of God, but also with all of us with each other. This, uh, this, the rabbis read it almost like a metaphor um, this back-to-back -back relationship um, and front-to-front -front relationship becomes not just a once a, a midrash about what happened once once for the for our earliest ancestor, but a transition that we all go through. So I'm going to share our text, our screen again. You should have this all on your sheet as well.
Great. Um, so this is um, um, this is by uh, uh, the Nisiran myth um, based on the writings of it's actually a dead Mizrahi. Um, Luriana Kabbalah, which comes from Svat in the 16th century, speaks in its unique symbolic language about a process of transformation between masculine and feminine energies. These energies and processes can be reflected historically, interpersonally, intrapsychically, meaning inside of our own minds, and within the divine. The cutting myth, which is the word nisira, means cutting, is a description of the process that takes place between the major symbols of the masculine and feminine. The cutting process has many details, but in summary, there are four stages to it. The first stage is when the masculine and feminine do not face each other. Their backs are fused to each other, like a joint twin sharing the same back. They literally have each other's back perpetually in a protective stance, but unable to see each other. In this stage, the feminine is smaller than the masculine and she lacks the ability to share her own light. Two, the second stage is when things are changing. The masculine falls asleep, apathetic, unaware, unconscious, and numb. Meanwhile, the feminine is growing. Three, in this stage, the feminine and masculine separate from each other. The feminine grows to the same size as the masculine. They each grow their own back where they were once fused. This stage is often marked with deems, sharp judgment necessary for cutting. Four, the final stages where they awaken as two complete beings. They no longer need deem, and they turn, the two turn to face each other. They meet again, but now they are equal. They are separate and independent beings, discovering that, that each of them is different, yet equal to each other. They can look eye to eye, face to face, soul to soul. Um, I'm just going to let you look at this. It's also on your sheets for a second. Um, and I'm going to ask the question as you're reading this. Um, so, so this all happens it's, um, for the mystics in every relationship. It happens inside of ourselves with the different parts inside of us. It happens in every relationship, in, in every relationship of lovers. Um, and even if they are not male and female, um, sometimes um, the ma the, the, in, in a uh, heteronormative and a male-female relationship, the, masculine, the male is actually playing the feminine role in the male, feminine is playing the male role um, this can be understood historically as maybe like the growth of feminine feminism over time, and um, and uh, and as uh, uh, I forget who said the the word shchina, this is also understood very much for the Kabbalists as the uh, as the growth of the feminine aspects of God coming into her fullness and able to look face to face. So I'm going to stop the share and we're going to take some, some thoughts in the, in the chat. Um, uh, Sarah says, uh, so uh, degrading, no equality. Okay, there we go. Um, the, I, uh, Jay asked about Panim El Panim. Panim, face-to-face -face relationships, uh, it's not the first time that this idea comes up. In fact, that actually comes from the Torah itself. Where God, where Moses asks slash demands to have a relationship, a face to face relationship with God, and God says, "You can't see my face. Like it's impossible to have a fully face to face relationship with God. You can see my back." Although it says maybe perplexingly at the end of Deuteronomy, maybe maybe like Moses dies with some sort of like a kiss, a face to face relationship. Um, so you can't live and have a face to face relationship, but maybe there's room for that without like beyond life. Um, um, but the mystics are definitely reading this and kind of building off of it. There's also the image that from the Talmud of um, the, um, in, the uh, in the tabernacle, there were two cherubs that were face to face uh, each other. The Talmud says when, when, when we were good as humans and when we weren't good, um, or as Jews, uh, we were we, the, these these cherubs f faced back to back, and um, and uh, the, the Rashi actually, when he's commenting on it, actually says that that, that union is actually a, is a sexual union when they're face to face. Um, but it's a um, so the the mystics are kind of an integrating both of those stories and reading it back into this Adam and Eve story. Um, um, where the animals were created in the earth, uh, if they're male and female, or the 
yeah, so the question of like gender and animals is a really great one. Um, sounds like growing up. Yeah, so there's uh, Michael uh, Margolia, um, or Margolius, uh, um, says that like it, this might be like a developmental thing over the course of our lives where uh, we like learn to have a more face-to-face -face relationship and it like makes room for lifelong learning. Um, definitely most of us pretty early start with instrumental relationships. Uh, I have a kid, I have a two and a half year old and a six month old and they, they're they like, you know, super warm and loving with me. But part of it is like, um, they, they, don't, they don't see me um, in my essence. Um, it's not like where kids start. Um, off topic, um, away on Netflix. I haven't seen it, but that sounds really um, wondering while in space, when would Shabbat? Okay, uh, there's, I, I would love to teach another class one day about holidays uh, in space. It's actually like a real uh, passion of mine. Um, and I had a conversation about it with some Harvard students yesterday. Uh, I'd be happy to come back and do that. Um, so the question about uh, God, uh, the Torah never says that God is male. And I wanna like, this is like great to, to like really say. Hebrew, all Hebrew words uh, are, are, are gendered and Hebrew defaults to the masculine gender usually uh, when describing God. But um, um, uh, there are lots of God names, including El Shaddai. Shaddai is related to the word for breasts. There's uh, there are feminine and masculine aspects of uh, and descriptions of God. And most of like what the Torah describes is kind of like our relationship. So if there are male mystics who are having those relationships and are writing our canon, a lot of the time, their language will be for a masculine God because maybe that's the way that they, they encountered it. Um, but, but I really believe that God is, is beyond gender. Um, um, uh, I always thought that God had no gender. So, that, so, so there's like two ways to think about it, Dina, like either God has no gender um, or, or God has all the genders. Um, and uh, both are really like interesting ways to, to work at, at it. Um, and um, yeah, that's actually what you wrote. Sorry, I'm just like trying to keep up. Um, that's so cool. I think that you could imagine both Maimonides would say that God is, has no gender. In fact, you can't say anything positive about God. Um, and, uh, but for the mystics, they're really interested in, in like the power of attraction and they wanna create gender everywhere they can. Um, and they end, it ends up in some interesting places. Um, um, yeah, and, uh, and the right and left side end up often being gendered, right being masculine and feminine being left. Um, in the Kab Kabbalah, I'm glad you, um, he is not just an, it, it's both a, an English translation and a, um, and the way that Hebrew defaults to a, to a Hebrew, uh, to a masculine, to, to masculine in the, um, in, in the pronouns, but there's no, like, we don't like get descriptions of the mat of like God's body being masculine or anything like that. Um, I want to just take us one step, uh, further. Um, there's also like a really cool, um, I forget her name, but she's a, um, um, there's, she's a midrashist at HUC in New York. And she said that, um, when it says they, man, that God created man and woman, that those are two examples of gender, uh, of the genders of humans, but not, but it's, but, it, but that, that's a, um, it's, it's not an exhaustive list. It's just the, um, it's like taking, it's, it's giving two examples and allowing uh, for, for variety. Like we say that, you know, God created fat and, uh, fat and skinny or tall and, and, and small uh, uh, or short people, but that doesn't mean that there aren't lots of other places in between. Um, so Marion's asking about counseling couples and I think that that's a great question. My approach to counseling couples and I, I'm, I'm actually doing a training in, um, in uh, family systems therapy and, uh, and kind of like reading Kabbalah and, and families together is really about how can we, especially in our romantic partnerships, turn face to face. And it's really hard. Um, because it, it, it makes us exposed. It often involves judgment and a Dean force of, of cutting. Um, and, um, and sitting with people 
in kind of going through transitions of, of actually what it looks like to, um, to see the other person as separate and as valuable and maybe as our other half. So there's this room for, um, like fundamentally when, when families have no conflict, they're not actually in relationship with each other, they're in relationships with yourself. I see it a lot with like young couples is that like they're in this honeymoon period. And the reason why honeymoon periods exist is actually because they're not meeting another person. They're meeting their fantasy of who that person is. And people assume that as soon as conflict comes up that there's something really wrong. Um, and it, it can be really painful. And sometimes it can mean the end of a relationship. But sometimes when you work through conflict, um, what you actually can, can find is that you're, you're actually in a relationship with someone who's not you, with someone who's different. Um, and, and, and that's actually a very powerful place to be able to, to see someone. Um, and, and in fact, you can't see their uniqueness and their value um, as long as they're just your, um, your fantasy of who they are or who they should be. That doesn't mean that there's not lots of relationships that don't work when people are in this kind of process. I just wanna um, say that there's, so this last text here, which I won't, I won't go into because we don't have time, or it's the second to the last text. Um, Martin Buber, I think through the Hasidic tradition, picks up on this binary and, and has, uh, creates his own duality. Instead of, he calls face-to-face -face relationships, I-thou relationships, or I-you relationships. And he calls the, uh, um, he calls the back-to-back -back relationships, I-it relationships. And there's a room, uh, and, and I Thou is an incredible book by Martin Booper. If you have any questions, um, I, like, like it, it's, it's a really, he thinks you can also have I Thou relationships with like plants and inanimate objects. Um, but um, it's really about moving from how we, or like noticing and having language for when you're having relationships with a, with a separate entity that has unique and ultimate value. Um, or whether you're having uh, relationships with someone because, uh, because they provide a service um, and, they, and they're reliable. And, and in all of our relationships, we're kind of like turning back to back. But there's something particular about romantic relationships and friendships and other things that particularly invite an I, thou, or face-to-face -face encounter. Um, Oh, I have so many questions for you and would love to have feedback. I, I want to respect uh, the 11 o'clock uh, end time, um, but I'm, if it's appropriate, I'm happy to stay on the line for a few minutes and, and answer um, uh, questions and chat. Um, sure, thank you. Sure. Um, I'm used to doing this like more in, in dialogue, in speaking together. Uh, with, with each other, but I, I hope that this was valuable um, and maybe challenging um, for uh, how we, um, we think about our relationships with ourselves, each other, and with the world.